The following is a Shaw TV public affairs presentation. Constituency Report is produced as a public service by members of the BC Legislature through the facilities of Shaw TV. Hello and welcome to Constituency Report. I'm Tracy Grimsard. Very pleased to welcome Todd Stone to the studio today. He is MLA for Kamloops South Thompson. Welcome back, Todd. How are you? Uh, it's great to be here. How are you? I'm terrific. Yeah, it's been a while since we last chatted, and of course now we're here in the middle of the spring <clears throat> legislative session already. Well, not not much has happened in uh, in the past eighteen months, wouldn't yeah. you say? No, it's yeah. been uh, fairly yeah. quiet. Pretty yeah. quiet on uh, BC's <laughs> political scene. That's right. That's right. Uh, the NDP, of course, has uh, recently delivered its first full budget. I know we're going to get into some of the specifics of that, but generally, what were some of your impressions? Well, I, you know, I always uh, try to start off with some positives. I, I, I do appreciate that the government has made, uh, as one of its top priorities, uh, an, an additional investment in child care and early childhood development. Um, mm -hmm. I made that a signature commitment of, of my recent uh, leadership campaign. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think governments always need to be looking for ways to do more to support uh, kids um, at their earliest ages. Uh, mm -hmm. you see, if, if we invest in them at that young age, uh, they're going to be more, uh, that much more likely to be successful throughout their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a few more dollars for seniors. Uh, uh, I think there should have been more, but at least there was a start there. Uh, I got to say, though, this was a, uh, at the end of the day, when you peel back some of the, uh, the positive aspects of this budget, it really was uh, a big uh, traditional NDP tax and spend budget. Mm -hmm. uh, about $5 billion of, of, of additional spending. And uh, you know, five and a half billion dollars worth of additional taxes uh, wow. on British Columbians. Personal income taxes are going up. The carbon tax is going up, and it's no longer revenue neutral. Uh, we have this uh, this doozy of all tax increases: the uh, employer health tax, mm -hmm. uh, the speculation tax, the foreign buyers tax. Uh, on and on and on it goes. Uh, I don't think this government really understands what it takes to grow an economy and, and to make sure that the revenues are there to pay for uh, the services that people need. So very disappointed mm -hmm. at the, uh, the level of taxation uh, and, um, and, and the, the massive increase in spending without any plan in this budget for how you grow the economy to actually pay for all that spending. Mm -hmm. It's all uh, tax hikes, as you mentioned, and uh, that doozy that you mentioned, the employer's health tax, that really came as a bit of a shock and surprise. Uh, how are businesses reacting to this? Well, uh, you know, there, there's no mention uh, of a jobs plan in this budget. Uh, you know, you, you'll recall our former government, uh, certainly over the last five years, we had a very, uh, you know, laser focus on creating jobs in communities big and small all across the province. No uh, definitive jobs plan in this budget. And in fact, uh, a layering on effect, uh, that this cumulative impact that is really going to be felt by, by small business in particular in mm -hmm. the weeks and the months ahead as a result of a broad array of increases in, in taxes for them. Uh, the government likes to say that, uh, well, they, you know, they, they reduced the, um, uh, the small business uh, income uh, tax rate. That was provided for in our final budget uh, last, you know, a year ago in our February 2017 budget. Right. Uh, but I point out to New Democrats, you have to actually make money in order to have to pay taxes. Uh, fewer small businesses and businesses generally are going to actually make a profit as a result of uh, the big arm of government coming in and taking more uh, from their bottom line. So mm -hmm. uh, businesses are, are, are saying to, uh, to me, and I'm hearing from a lot of small businesses in particular, that, that when you couple the, uh, the rapid increase in the, in the minimum wage uh, uh, the, the minimum wage hikes going get, getting to $15 per hour pretty quickly with the employer health tax, uh, with a number of other um, you know, regulatory burdens which are being downloaded onto small business, uh, many are wondering if they're going to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, are they going to have to lay people off? Are they going to have to increase prices for their customers? Uh, are they going to be in business uh, a year or two from now? I yeah. mean, those are the kinds of uh, things that are running through a lot of people's minds, and these are the job creators. These are the mm -hmm. people that create uh, uh, employment for themselves and for thousands of other British Columbians. Yeah, and that new payroll tax certainly has a lot of people irate locally in Kamloops. Have you heard of any businesses, organizations that are really concerned about it? 
Uh, every day. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is probably one of the most half-baked uh, tax plans that, that uh, I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 first off, uh, you know, some are focusing a lot of attention on small business and, and medium-sized business. Uh, uh, I, I have featured a few companies, uh, a few businesses in Kamloops. Uh, Nature's uh, f uh, Fair Markets mm -hmm. uh, is going to be hit with a $2 million uh, additional cost to their bottom line every single year when this wow. employer health tax is, is, is fully phased in. Uh, th there are 60 jobs in Kamloops uh, through Nature's Fair Markets. They're not sure that they're going to be able to stay in business with that uh, significant of a hit to their bottom line. Mm -hmm. uh, interior plumbing and heating. They've been in business in Kamloops for almost 70 years. And uh, they're, they're facing a $185,000 hit to their bottom line. But it gets even better than this. Uh, it turns out that the government, is, uh, as part of this tax plan, is going to tax government is going to tax itself. Hmm. Our school district in Kamloops is going to be hit with a $250,000 annual uh, cost to their bottom line. Apparently the NDP is not going to, to make school districts whole. Mm -hmm. TRU, our university, is going to be faced with a $1.5 million annual hit. Um, that's likely going to put pressure on tuition. Um, NDP hasn't con uh, said that they're going to make universities whole. Mm -hmm. The city of Kamloops uh, is going to be taxed uh, uh, to the tune of an additional million dollars a year because this applies to fire and police and all payroll costs. Mm -hmm. And if that isn't enough, uh, Ask Wellness is, a, is an example of the kinds of, of, of non-profit organizations that are, that are doing incredible work looking after the most vulnerable in our community. Mm -hmm. This organization, which, which uh, uh, is all about providing affordable housing uh, for you know, those with mental health challenges and addictions and others, they're going to be faced with a $100,000 hit to their bottom line uh, wow. because of what their payroll is. They don't make profit. Uh, they don't know where they're going to take that from. Uh, they're going to have to pull some services out. So the government has not thought this new employer health tax through. It's going to result in higher prices for consumers. It's going to result in people losing their jobs. It's going to, it's going to slow down growth in, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the small business sector. Uh, and um, you know, all so that the NDP can try to create the illusion that they've 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 gotten rid of MSP premiums. Really, all they've done is they've replaced uh, the the MSP system with an equally regressive um, employer health tax system. That's mm -hmm. going to have huge impacts, negative impacts, on a lot of British Columbians. Well, speaking of poorly thought out, I think some might file the speculation tax under that category as well. What are you hearing from people on that issue? Well, you know, initially uh, the speculation tax actually, um, when, when people first hear that, uh, it, it conjures up, uh, you know, an image of, of cracking down on uh, foreign speculators, you know, people that are coming into our province who don't pay tax here, who are, uh, you know, who are um, through their actions, their speculation in the real estate market are driving prices up. Right. There's no question that there is some element of that. And our government uh, began to take some initiatives through the foreign buyers tax and a few other things when uh, we were still in office. Uh, this speculation tax, however, is anything but. A, uh, it's, it's, it's about any, you know, whole, all kinds of things um, other than speculation. Uh, mm -hmm. We learn now that this tax is going to apply uh, to British Columbians. Uh, i give you one example. You're, you're a, 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 a senior couple and back in 1975 you purchased a, a cabin on, uh, in the Okanagan somewhere mm -hmm. within one of these zones that the NDP have created, the speculation zone. Right. Uh, that's a cabin that's been in the family uh, for you know, the last 50 years. And uh, you're now going to, be, because it's deemed to be a speculative investment by the NDP, that senior couple is now going to have to pay an annual tax uh, on that uh, on that cabin, mm -hmm. uh, we've also sent a signal through the speculation tax. Uh, the NDP has sent a signal to other Canadians uh, who uh, have purchased a, a property, uh, a, a residence in in British Columbia, often their recreational properties, with the intention of retiring in this province. Uh, they 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 actually use all kinds of services um, mm -hmm. to support looking after that recreational property when they're in the province. They're buying boats and you know, skidoos and you know, using landscape companies and contractors and shopping in our local hardware stores, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They're now being told that they're less Canadian than British Columbians are and they're going to be hit with this tax. Uh, all that does is tell all kinds of Canadians and people from around the world, this is not a, a place to invest. Don't come to British Columbia. Yeah. So again, another example of a half-baked tax uh, that the NDP, I think, 
you know, it must have, they must have all sort of drank their own bathwater on this and got to a place of you know sticking it into the budget, thinking that people would uh, would throw a parade for them. Mm -hmm. uh, this is going to have huge, very negative consequences on a lot of British Columbians who are anything but speculators in the real estate market. Yeah, and certainly a lot of the details around the speculation tax have been a bit sketchy, sort of a wait and see approach. We've heard different things from the finance minister and the premier on this. That's not very comforting to people. I mean, they've they've put out a budget. How can you sort of have some credibility with that budget when there's all these questions surrounding Well, it? and that's a very good point. At the end of the day, the finance minister has one and one very important job, and that is to uh, present the people of this province uh, with a fully costed budget mm -hmm. uh, that details all of the projected uh, uh, you know revenue sources and all of the projected uh, expense uh, in, in in you know line by line fashion across all ministries mm -hmm. when it comes to the speculation tax uh, they're projecting a tax which is intended to end speculation and reduce real estate prices uh, is is projected to generate 80 million dollars this year and then 200 million dollars next year and 200 million dollars the year after that mm -hmm. Uh, if if the tax is going to work uh, so brilliantly well uh, as they suggest it will, then why are they projecting revenues to uh, to actually increase to two hundred million dollars um, on an annual basis? Mm -hmm. We ask um, uh, we've been asking for weeks now in the legislature for details on how is this tax actually going to work. The bulletins that the Ministry of Finance is putting out are very different than what the Minister of Finance is saying in the legislative chamber, mm -hmm. and we're saying you know which story is it? The minister keeps saying to us, "Stay tuned." <laughs> the details are forthcoming. Well, you know, I say to the Minister of Finance that uh, your job is to make sure British Columbians know how this budget impacts them. And those details should have been thought through. They should have been fully uh, fully incorporated into, into this announcement uh, mm -hmm. before it was rolled into a, a provincial budget. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, I think it shows the um, the lack of experience um, and, and the lack of wherewithal that this government uh, has when it comes to actually uh, looking after a, a budget that's uh, you know well in excess of fifty billion dollars per year. It's scary. Mm -hmm. uh, and I should say uh, on the on the speculation tax piece, I really believe in my heart of hearts that this is the thin edge of the wedge towards an inheritance tax. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that the NDP is coming after uh, uh, you know British Columbians inheritances. Uh, which uh, you know, God help us if they if they try to go there, uh, we'll fight it every step of the way. But this is a first step towards that, where you're actually going after people's uh, cabins, you're going after their recreational properties, which in no way are, are playing a role in, in inflating uh, real estate prices, which is largely the uh, an issue in the Lower Mainland. Mm -hmm. uh, so stay tuned on on that front. Uh, I think uh, we have not seen the last of the of the of the tax increases and the attempts to reach into people's pockets deeper and deeper and deeper from this NDP government. Mm -hmm. And when you look at uh, all these different tax increases in their totality, how does that square up with the notion of affordability that the NDP campaigned on? Well, uh, you know, they, well, they have taken some measures that, uh, you know, they, they will say are all about affordability and, um, and some of them, uh, you know, I, I think certainly are. Uh, th there are other things that they are doing which are going to wash away any any uh, benefits that would have been de derived from the, the affordability initiative. So, uh, the the speculation tax, the employer health tax, these kinds of things, the carbon tax, uh, you know, are actually driving up. They're going to drive up prices. Mm -hmm. They're actually going to make life uh, less less affordable for people. Right. Uh, gas prices are are going up. We we anticipate uh, you know four five six cents a liter as a result of the, the additional carbon tax, mm -hmm. uh, and that will become an annual uh, increase. By the way, mm -hmm. uh, that's on top of what are already the highest gas prices in in all of North America. Um, uh, it, 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 it's just hard to hard to square the claim that life will be more affordable when they're actually driving up costs in many respects. And don't forget, there were many signature commitments that the NDP made which were not uh, included in this last budget. They don't talk about ten dollar a day daycare. Mm -hmm. anymore. Now, I acknowledge they are putting some additional investment in on top of the investments that we've previously made, but there's no $10 a day daycare anywhere to be seen. And they also promised a $400 uh, uh, you know, annual renter's rebate That's for renters gone. in this province. <laughs> they don't talk about that either. Um, those are two examples of items that uh, seem to have gone missing in action, which were all about uh, affordability. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I know we're going to get into some of the local projects that I'm sure people are very curious about. But before we do, we're going to sh take a short break here on Constituency Report. Grab a pen and paper. We'll put up contact information for MLA Todd Stone. Back to chat much more with him right after this.
Welcome back to Constituency Report as we continue our chat today with Kamloops Health Thompson, MLA Todd Stone. And turning to some local issues and projects, uh, I wanted to ask a bit about uh, any capital projects on the horizon as far as the school district is concerned. Uh, well, so uh, everyone in Kamloops knows that uh, uh, while enrollment declined for 18 years in a row, uh, about 23% during that time, enrollment in our schools leveled off in about 2014, mm -hmm. and since that time have been steadily increasing. And we have a situation now that where enrollment continues to be uh, weak in the rural areas of School District 73, uh, and generally flat on the North Shore, with the exception of uh, in and around Westmount. Uh, we have huge uh, pressures in our schools on the South Shore. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Valley View Secondary at the moment is at 143% uh, capacity, wow. uh, which means more portables are on their way. Uh, it, it will grow to about 168% capacity over the next four years if, if uh, a more long-term solution isn't put in place. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of our secondary schools are jammed uh, in, in Kamloops, particularly on the South Shore. Mm -hmm. So the number one capital request of the school district uh, at the moment is a, a $21 million expansion of Valley View Secondary, which would actually go a long ways to alleviating the pressure that exists in the secondary system across Kamloops. Mm -hmm. um, Second priority is an expansion at Westmount in uh, North Kamloops. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's much needed. And the third priority is a new school uh, up in Pineview Valley mm -hmm. uh, because our elementary schools on the South Shore, again, are bursting at the seams. It uh, doesn't matter if you're talking um, uh, uh, Dufferin or Al uh, uh, Albert McGowan or Juniper Ridge. Uh, they're all bursting at the seams. And that reflects the growth that we generally are, you know, are pleased to see taking place in Kamloops. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Peter Millibar and I are, uh, as often as we possibly can, in the legislature legislature where uh, you know we're up and asking questions of the Minister of Education. I asked some questions the other day. Uh, I, I was uh, 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 less than excited about uh, the response that I got. I, it doesn't sound like uh, there's going to be any capital flowing into the uh, Campbell School District, uh, uh, certainly not in the next three years, maybe four or five years from now. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to continue to press as hard as we can and, and uh, because we do need that capital. Um, I do, um, I do know that uh, there is a, um, a fund that, that you know, we had previously established that's still there, a $100 million annual fund for expansions and renovation projects of schools. Uh, I pleaded with the minister to uh, consider at least the Valley View project as a start. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Westmount, I know Peter was, was uh, pressing on that one as well right. uh, to come from that fund. So fingers crossed, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm not holding out my breath uh, that anything uh, positive is going to happen on that front in the next three years or so. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll keep our eye on that for sure. Uh, turning to health care, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering uh, how progress is coming along on phase two of the Royal Inland Hospital expansion. Tell us a bit about that. Well, uh, that one is probably a, a more positive, uh, a positive story than, than school capital at the moment. Uh, the $417 million uh, Royal Inland Hospital patient care tower project, which uh, uh, both Peter as a former um, hospital board chair and, and, you know, I was a former member of cabinet and with Terry Lake. And, yeah. you know, we all worked really hard with lots of other people as well to usher that project along. Um, the good news is it is still in the, in the, the current government's capital plan. Mm -hmm. um, the Minister of Health has confirmed on several occasions, uh, both to Peter and me, that the project is still on schedule. It appears to still be on budget. Great. Uh, so that's, that's all good news. Mm -hmm. What we're going to be paying close attention to is this. Uh, the NDP government is now talking about, um, um, in their RFP tendering process, embracing best bid, mm -hmm. not necessarily lowest bid. Mm. And this is an arrangement that they're, they're coming up with uh, with, uh, with a number of the, uh, the, the, the building trades uh, unions. Right. Um, if you hearken back to the NDP of the 1990s and the, the fair wage policy and highway construction and particularly the island highway on Vancouver Island, mm -hmm. uh, we got a, a, an inferior product built at a much inflated cost because a lot of the labor costs were inflated and um, you know we paid more than we probably should have. Right. Uh, we're going to be keeping a close eye on this project because um, if indeed they move to this new tendering process, best bid as they call it, um, that's, going to have, that's going to have potentially the unintended consequence of, of uh, pushing that $417 million price tag higher. Mm -hmm. Fine, if they're willing to cover the additional cost, uh, great. But if the government's not willing to do that and the project cost is escalated, then that could mean the scope ends up being compromised, the scope of what the hospital actually will include. Right. 
And that will be wrong. That will be a terrible mistake uh, if the NDP government go there. So uh, again, this is what you know, Peter and, and my job is to keep this government on track or, or at least hold them accountable yeah. uh, and make sure that this patient care tower as scoped out, gets built, and then it gets built within the time frames that have been committed. Mm -hmm. That example you gave was a good segue. I want to talk about transportation. I know this is uh, an issue that's still near and dear to your heart. Uh, where do things stand with regards to the Trans-Canada Highway expansion? Well, uh, I was up uh, on my feet uh, questioning the Minister of Transportation in the legislature the other day and uh, you know, was able to... Uh, uh, take the opportunity to, to, to clarify that the uh, timelines uh, for the additional three projects uh, east of Hoffman's Bluff mm -hmm. uh, are, are all delayed now. Uh, they, they will be delayed by at least a year. Um, there's a middle section uh, from Chase, uh, Chase Creek Road to Chase West uh, that largely goes through the Nisconleth uh, First Nations Reserve lands. Mm -hmm. um, that project appears to be a couple years uh, delayed. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's bad news. Uh, and and I, I, you know, it's hard to, to put exactly put your finger on exactly why the, the projects are delayed. Um, the NDP do say that their strategy, their approach with the Trans-Canada Highway is to accelerate projects. Well, I, you know, as I pointed out to the minister, I don't know how one and two year delays on the three segments east of Kamloops represents acceleration. But again, this is the NDP that we're dealing with. So, um, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm told that there will be, an, uh, you know, more money uh, made available in the budget in, over the years ahead for Trans-Canada four laning uh, mm -hmm. from Kamloops to the Alberta border. Uh, we're going to continue all of the MLAs along that through that corridor. Uh, we're going to continue to do everything that we can to ensure that those projects, uh, if they've already been announced, that they stay on track as best as possible. And if they haven't been announced yet, that they do get announced uh, because we do know it's the most important east-west connection mm -hmm. uh, between British Columbia and the rest of Canada. And continuing to invest in the safe movement of people and goods through that corridor has to uh, be, a, be a top priority of the government. Mm -hmm. uh, we recently learned that Greyhound is going to be cutting services to a number of BC communities. Will Kamloops be affected by that? Uh, Kamloops, uh, we learned, was affected uh, insofar as uh, reductions in service between Kamloops and Kelowna, mm -hmm. uh, which again is, uh, is unfortunate. Um, I, I had Greyhound march into my office uh, three or four times when I was the Minister of Transportation and you know, without calling into question any of how they do what they do, I mean they're yeah. a private business and they, they have a right uh, obviously to make decisions that they believe are in their best interest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they often wanted to talk to me about uh, seeking our blessing to reduce uh, service in, in largely in rural and northern British Columbia. Uh, and you know, I, I made clear to them every time they were in my office that that we really expected them uh, to, uh, to to be there for British Columbians, uh, particularly along Highway 97 and Highway 16, Highway 5 uh, mm -hmm. in the northern half of the province. Right. And so they're you know we were fairly successful at at keeping their service in place, notwithstanding unrelenting attacks from the NDP all through through the time I was the minister responsible. Um, you know, I put in, in place a $6 million transportation plan along Highway 16, yeah. uh, which to this day is, is very much appreciated for in, increasing the safety of, of um, particularly women and, and girls uh, through that corridor. Uh, NDP have been in power for eight months and uh, they're nowhere on this file. Hmm. They're, uh, you know, Greyhound has pulled out. Uh, they've canceled a whole bunch of, uh, of, of service in the northern half of British Columbia and some service between Kamloops and Kelowna. Mm -hmm. And uh, the best that the Minister of Transportation can say is that she's uh, consulting uh, people. Well, you know, a lot of luck that a lot of good that that does people. Mm -hmm. um, for for many, this is their only option uh, to get from one one community to another. Mm -hmm. uh, just about five minutes left in the show. I want to ask about Thompson Rivers University. We heard an announcement recently about engineering seats, but uh, not quite exactly what the NDP promised, I understand. Well, uh, again, uh, as with everything in, in this NDP government, we have to, you know, the devil's always in the details. And uh, while it was certainly welcome news that they followed through on what we had already announced and what we had already budgeted for, which was uh, the launch of a long awaited for engineering program at TRU. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not exactly what uh, we were expecting to uh, to hear once the details were, were known. Right. We committed to uh, an engineering program in three disciplines, software engineering, hardware engineering, and electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. All three highly, highly um, uh, uh, sought after professions uh, in Kamloops and around British Columbia. 
the NDP uh, scaled that back to uh, software engineering only, which is good. Uh, in and of itself, that's good, mm -hmm. but very disappointed that they pulled out the hardware and the electrical engineering components from this program. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to continue to advocate for, for, for those additional um, engineering degrees at, at TRU. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, it was sad that the NDP uh, you know, pulled back uh, as they did, because uh, that just does a disservice to the people and the, and the kids of Kamloops. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, we have uh, some great photos of uh, so many wonderful community events. Uh, here's uh, a couple from uh, visits with the tech sector. Oh, so you know, Camelops Innovation, uh, they are incredible, uh, yeah. punching way above their weight. Uh, you know, there's, there's now uh, 250 tech companies in Camelops employing 1,500 people. Wow. Here's one here, Hummingbird Drones, uh, state-of-the-art technology that's being used by government agencies all over North America now. Based, started in Kamloops, based in Kamloops. Uh, yeah. These guys are rocking it. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're winning awards, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, all over all over uh, uh, all over North America. Yeah, and uh, I know the Empty Bowls fundraiser. Uh, that's always uh, a really important fundraiser for the Kamloops Food Bank. The Kamloops Food Bank uh, again, which uh, you know provides such an incredible uh, service. Uh, this is uh, with uh, Peter and obviously our, our mayor Ken Christian, and uh, it's a fun event. We get up and auction uh, bowls from Solis signed by celebrities and yeah. all of the proceeds go uh, go into supporting the the efforts of the food bank. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kamloops uh, hosted its first Pride Parade uh, this past summer, a well-attended event. Your well, family I, was there? Yeah, there, there <laughs> we are, this uh, Chantel and, and, and I with our three daughters. And, uh, you know, it's just great. It just is a reflection of, of where Kamloops is today, right? Mm -hmm. It's becoming increasingly a, uh, a cosmopolitan city with, uh, you know, uh, not not... not Afraid to to be uh, to to put on a, a pride uh, uh, event like this, yep. and and thousands of people showed up for it. Uh, I think even the organizers were were astounded at just how much uh, what what an outpouring of support there was from the broader community. Mm -hmm. So we saw your entire family pictured there, but we didn't see the newest member <clears throat> of your family, an adorable puppy. We have to get to this photo before <laughs> we end the show. Little little Jasper. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I I had said to my girls, uh, uh, you know, all through the recent leadership campaign and in fact I've been in politics for five years now that uh, once the leadership campaign was over we'd go shopping for a puppy mm -hmm. and and I proudly <laughs> stood up on a chair and I announced uh, that to uh, to my in my three daughters in front of hundreds of people on the <laughs> night of the leadership convention yeah and uh, and so you know two weeks later we went and found uh, little Jasper and yeah. uh, he's he's an adorable welcome addition to the family the girls are very happy <laughs> uh, and uh, Daddy was able to uh, to say promise made, promise kept. Exactly. In a, in a family context. <laughs> well, he looks like he's a very uh, cuddly addition to the family. Yeah, yes, he's, 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 uh, it's nice to have another another um, another boy uh, in the that's house. That's right, uh, that's as right. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Getting slightly more balanced. Yeah, so it's all good. <laughs> well, it's been wonderful to have you on the show today, Todd. Thanks so much. Thanks, Tracy. Todd Stone, he is MLA for Kamloops South Thompson. If you'd like more information about some of the topics and issues we've discussed on the program today, you can check Check out his website, toddstonemla.ca, and you can find him active on social media as well. Thanks so much for watching Constituency Report.